in three, two. Good evening. I now call to order the Equity Committee meeting with the Equity Advisory Council for Thursday, March 24th, 2022. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, committee and council members will state their names before speaking. Ms. Fast, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Scott? Present. Dr. Hager? Ms. Jose? Ms. Rowe? Present. Mr. Thomas? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fast, please call the names of those staff members on the Equity Committee attending oh, uh, today's meeting. Thank you. Dr. Yarborough? Here. Mr. Handy? Present. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Fast, could you please call the role of the Equity Advisory Council members participating in today's meeting? Abir Shanawi? Present. Avery Webb. Dr. Farrowin. Bianca Crockett. Present. Brianna Ross. Present. Clifford Collins. Donna Sibley. Present. Aaron O'Toole Trivis. Dr. Aaron Sullivan, Frank Dunlap, present, Heather Denmeyer, present, Jackie Brewster, Jane Lee, Kelvin Ganesh, Kevin Jennings, Lauren Tillman, Present. Lena Polite. Lisa Norton. Maggie Cummins. Marcellus McQueen. Maria Lowry. Marlena Purcell Colleton. Megan Stewart Sicking. Michelle Stansberry. Monica joins. Oh, sorry, Miss Stansberry, you're here. <laughs> Monica joins Massey. Dr. Monica Sample. Sam Tillman. Dr. Scott Krugman. Shane Jensen. Sherelle Jones. Solomon Davis. Tiffany Stith and Dr. Zamira Simpkins. Thank you. Great, thank you. And if you could call the roll and note any names of um, any additional staff members participating in the meeting. I don't believe there are any additional staff members, but if I did not call your name, please let me know. Okay. And um, are there any other board members who are participating on the call that um, that I've not named? Ms. Scott, this is Molly. Okay, thank you. It's Ms. Jose. Okay, great. So um, the first item of new business is a presentation on the duality of Arab and Muslim students. And for that, I call on Mr. Handy. Thank you, Ms. Scott. So very excited about this presentation coming up and I see some other uh, council members and committee members are also excited. Uh, this response is in, uh, I'm sorry, this presentation is in response to a request from the uh, equity board committee members to hear from the advisory council members. So uh, one thing we wanna do is make sure we're sharing our multiple perspectives. Um, each of our council members 
uh, has a particular representation, a particular identity they bring to this council, and we want to hear um, really from the range of identities and roles that you all fill. So this evening we have a presentation from one of our council members, uh, Ms. Abir Ramadan Shanawi, and I'm going to turn it over to her at this time. So thank you for being here with us this evening. Thank you, Doug. Thank you everyone for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and I'm excited to present. So as uh, Ms. Scott said, today I'll be presenting on the duality of Arab and Muslim students. And as I go through the presentation, you'll understand why the term duality is used, uh, definitely for equity uh, committee and meeting. And as a parent to students who go to Baltimore County schools and a former Baltimore County employee, this is also a topic that's very dear to me, also from a lived experience. Next slide, please, Mr. Corns. Thank you. So objectives for this session, of course, I'm a teacher at heart, so we always have to have our objectives. Uh, I'd like to provide a background information and debunk some myths and stereotypes about Arab and Muslim students. And there's a, a, a reason why I'm separating the two, as we will talk later in the presentation. I need to discuss the importance of countering anti-Muslim harassment and bias in schools. Notice I don't use the word Islamophobia because personally I don't like the term Islamophobia. Phobia always denotes that the onus is on the people who are being um, feared. So I prefer anti-Muslim harassment or anti-Muslim hate because that really gets to the root of the problem and biases in schools, whether it's explicit or implicit. And then hopefully review through a few strategies on how to help increase awareness on creating safe school environments for Muslim and Arab students, but also to understand that what we do for one group of students really benefits all students as well. Next slide, please. So a little bit about myself, um, Abir Ramadan Shinawi. I'm a former BCPS teacher. I am always a teacher, teacher at heart, a teacher advocate. I am a parent of three BCPS students. One of my oldest daughter graduated from Towson High. Um, my middle child recently graduated and I have a child who's in middle school. Currently my position is I'm the associate director of program for a nonprofit called Reimagining Migration. They are actually located in Boston, but I call myself a telecommute. I am first generation Palestinian American, so um, I'm a child of immigrants. I wear that proudly. I tell that to everybody. It is my lived experience, and I think it's also important to let people know that I am Palestinian American due to a lot of the politics that come when you're talking about that particular uh, region of the world and also what it means to be uh, part of a marginalized group. Uh, but also the fact that, you know, we do have a large population in this country that have contributed to the growth of the United States. I am bilingual. I am fluent in Arabic and in English. And uh, I do call Chicago home. Uh, you know, I go there very often. My family live on the south side and especially in the suburbs. And it is one of the largest Arab American communities in the United States, especially one of the largest Palestinian communities. The area that my family resides in right now that I grew up is really on Google Maps called Little Palestine, which we're very proud of. Next slide, please. So I want to start with a little bit of data about American Muslims and the national data because people think when you talk about Muslims or Americans, it's a relatively new phenomenon, but you're gonna find out later that it's really not something so new. So let's start with the data first. Thank you. Um, this quote is very, very popular. Muslim, uh, Muslims are America's most ethnically diverse faith community. And actually worldwide, Islam is one of the most diverse faiths um, all over, but in America, it's one of the most ethnically diverse faith communities that you'll ever come across due to the fact that you have Muslims from all over the world. And if you go to a particular mosque, you can definitely find people who represent different cultures, races and ethnicities, but the commonality, commonality among all of them is their faith, which is them being Muslims. Next slide. So there's a video right here, hopefully we can watch it, but if you take a look at um, the Institute for Social um, Policy is who are the American Muslims? And here, if you take a look at the, the I guess I hate to use, oops, something happened. Oh, we're going to the video. Hello? Yeah, so uh, Mr. Alley, I'm here. I don't know, Mr. Corns, are you able to get to the video? Because he might have a PDF. Yeah, yeah. so I um, I was uh, unaware there was a video embedded, so I had failed to share sound. So just give me a second so I can flip this over. Oh, okay? that's fine. Okay, sure. Thank yeah. you. My, my apologies. That's okay, I thought it was on my end. 
No, no I actually don't do anything wrong. Uh, but I, there you still, go. Orange, I'll take credit for that. <laughs> actually, I should have <laughs> given you the hit. Yeah, that's okay. Just let me let me grab it again. Okay. Sure. So are we, re uh, are we uh, ready? Just to get, watch the video? Give me a minute. Let me like kind of preload the the video for everyone. So if you take a look at the charts, um, the variations of the the groups of people that represent Muslim communities. Now, one part about that chart that I'll talk about later is that blue piece, which is quote unquote white. Now there are many people who identify who are white ethnically. But we also have to take into account that Arabs are considered white on the census. So that could be very skewed as to what group of population we're talking about with that. But if you take a look and the largest population there, of course, is black and African-American. Um, and so it, it just shows you the variation based on other religions of how diverse uh, the Muslim community can be and how that can really um, put the concept of how to address your Muslim students at the forefront because of the racial and ethnic diversity within the re religion. Go ahead, Mr. Corns. Racial or ethnic majority within the Muslim community. About racial or ethnic majority within the Muslim community. About one in five U.S. Muslims are immigrants from South Asia, so from countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. About one in seven are immigrants from uh, the Middle East, North Africa, Arabs from countries like Egypt and Syria and Lebanon. Um, and another one in seven are U.S. born blacks um, who draw upon the uh, longer American heritage of Islam. So that's one way in which there's a great deal of diversity. Thank you for that. So I know we have a question in the chat. I'm assuming, Mr. Handy, that we'll do questions at the end, um, if, if that's OK. Yes, thank you. So I actually yes. uh, thank you, Ms. Rowe, for the question. Ms. Scott, I was about to say I was going to defer to Ms. Scott. So we'll hold those to the end. Thank you. Sure. Yes, we'll do questions at the end. Perfect, thanks. So that was a very quick clip to kind of give us a precursor what we're going to talk about next. But again, uh, Islam is a very diverse religion worldwide, but also within the United States. So point number two, the concept of Muslim versus Arab, understanding the difference. Next slide, please, Mr. Corns. You know, it's a common myth that all, you know, Arabs are Muslim, but it, it's, it goes to say that not all Muslims are Arabs and not all Arabs are Muslims. Uh, to be exact, I think Arabs only make 25% of the Muslim population. The largest Muslim population to date right now is the country of Indonesia um, because that's such a has such a large population. But I think the myth comes from the fact that Islam did begin in Saudi Arabia and that has always been kind of the foundation of what Islam is all about since Mecca's there. We do the pilgrimage there. So that's where all the, the stereotypes came from. But what we tend to forget is we tend to forget honoring those who really came first to this country as Muslims. Um, un unfortunately, they came as a forced migration. So the very first Muslim Americans who I always say we were always here were enslaved Muslims. And the fact that they played you know, a very vital role in the European expeditions as well, not only did they come as enslaved uh, Muslims, but also if we talk about the Spanish when they came here, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, they came as sailors, they came as merchants, um, they were astronomers. At the time, Muslims were very well versed in world trade and also had a very strong hold on the world trade, especially connections to the Silk Road. But unfortunately, the very among the first Muslims to come here and stayed were enslaved Africans. And over here, we talk about them as the Moors. If you know much about like Southern uh, South Carolina or the Southern states, there were groups um, who did later create their own communities. A lot of those people have uh, descendants from uh, West African enslavement, of course. And then they say this, the estimate is 10 to 50 percent of the 10 million Africans brought to the shores against their will were Muslims, unfortunately. But there's a very important piece as to why this should be known and this should be um, studied. So we have this amazing man, um, Bilal Fula, or uh, known as Al Hajj Amr ibn Said. So his records indicate coming as an enslaved Muslim, but he came when he was much older. He was uh, later on detained, but he wrote his entire autobiography in Arabic on the walls of his prison cell, and I believe it was North Carolina. And that was the first account of uh, an enslaved person who wrote their biography, but it was a first account and it was an authentic account. But what he also talks about and, and proves, which are a lot of the stereotypes that a lot of enslaved people were not learned, 
they didn't have any skill sets, which was quite the opposite. What we learn from enslaved Africans, especially if they're Muslims, is the reason why they were quote unquote sought after is because they were highly skilled. Uh, again, they were very uh, well educated because in Islam, that's something that's um, you know taught from a very young age. And again, they were very good traders. And when they came here, they brought a lot of those trades. So it changes and shifts the narrative as to who the enslaved Africans were and what they actually brought with them, but also what they were able to do when they were here. But again, with his own um, biography and autobiography, that really, oh. yes that really flips the script as to the perceptions of enslaved Africans as well. But also as Muslims, we need to honor them because they were the first ones here. The month of Ramadan is coming up next week. And for many of you, you may know that during Ramadan, we, uh, we fast from sunrise to sunset, no water, no nothing. And uh, I get emotional thinking that these enslaved Africans, when they came here, were actually fasting when they were doing their work and they held tightly to their faith. So we honor them as the first Muslim Americans to really come to this country. Next slide, please. We also know that around 1530, the first known Muslims in North America did come with the Spanish and if, you know, with the Spanish um, territories back in the Southwest. And I know you can go to places like New Mexico and see the different tombstones for different um, people who came with the Spanish, whether they were Jewish or they were Muslim. Um, another really great account would be reading Leila Lalami's The Moor's Account, which it's a fictitious story, but it really captures um, Estebianco's uh, account of him coming as a translator, but also when the Spanish are trying to work with the indigenous populations, the indigenous people actually prefer to work with him as opposed to the Spanish because they could relate to him more and he just had a better idea of how to deal with enslaved um, I'm sorry, with the indigenous population. And then between 1878 and 1924, that's when the largest influx of Muslims started to come, especially from areas of the Middle East, which were at, they weren't considered Syria and Lebanon technically until after the 1920s, especially with the Sykes-Picot Agreement, but they arrived in large numbers with the fall of the Ottoman Empire, and they mainly settled in the Midwest due to economic reasons. And um, there's a new book that came out by Professor Edward Curtis from Indiana University that really highlights the Arab and Muslim communities that took place in the southern part of Illinois and parts of Indiana and Ohio. So again, as you see, Muslims have really been here for a long time. We just don't read about them or know about them or add them in the curriculum to really show the rich history of them being part of this, uh, this country. Next slide. So who are Arab Americans? And that's a good uh, question because people no longer want to call themselves Arab Americans. I think one of the labels is MENA, which means Middle Eastern and North African, because again, being Arab is more of an ethnicity than a race, because technically you have people who have Arab culture, or Arab characteristics, or they speak Arabic, but at the same time, like if you're from Sudan or if you're from Mauritania, people there also identify as African or they're Sudanese, and they're also, you know, Arabic speaking, so they consider themselves Arab. But the first generations did come from the Middle East in the 19th century. Majority of them were Christian, young, male and single. And I think that's a very important point because when people think of Arabs, again, they think they're mainly Muslim, but we're also denying the fact that, you know, the, the, the basis of Christianity is in some of the major um, Arab countries, which has a large history of Christian Arabs as well. From modern day Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Palestine and Jordan, just like a lot of the um, immigrants before them that came. Economic gain, again, it was the end of the Ottoman Empire. So there was a lot of political strife that was going on. So they came, they moved to major cities, but a lot of them did become peddlers, which later on became either a very successful business or they moved on to other things. Point number five is very important because this is how you get the census. Um, they did not identify as Arabs actually when they came under Ottoman rule, therefore they were labeled quote unquote as Turks or Syrians interchangeably. Therefore, when they came here, that's how they got identified as white. Turkey technically is not an Arab country. It's not at all. They're not Arabs. Therefore, they're part of, you know, they're the uh, bridge between Europe and Asia. But when they came here as labeled as Turks, that's where you get the term white on the census, which is why Arabs don't have anything on the census, but white historically because of that. Um, just some other stats of where you get 1920s, you had over 250,000 Syrians and Lebanese and Palestinians living in the United States. But the largest influx and waves of Arab immigrants 
came in the 50s and 60s due to the political climate that was happening, with, and which was very common if you see in um, countries in Africa that were gaining their independence from post-colonial um, you know, uh, rule. Same was happening for Arabs, where there was a lot of shifting in political and economic factors, and therefore a lot of them did end up coming to starting in South America. If you know much about South America as well, Brazil, Colombia have a large Arab population, and then they moved on up to North America and the United States. Next slide, please. So building America, you know, it's it's funny um, when we think of Arabs and me growing up as an Arab, I never thought of us, quote unquote, building America. But then I've, as, as I started doing my research and getting more into the concept of Arabs as well, you know, it's it's a growing population. They say it's one of the largest growing populations in the United States. Um, it grew about 72 percent between 2010 and 2020. Again, a lot of that has to do with political and economic issues in that region. Uh, of course, 90% live in urban areas. I'm a product of that. I grew up, like I said, on South Side Chicago, Marquette Park, where a lot of people, that's where you find your economic um, opportunities, and then people tend to branch out into the suburbs. Cities with the largest Arab populations, you have Los Angeles, Detroit, New York, Chicago, and they say DC has a large population as well. Now, Detroit is very unique because what happened in Detroit was you have a very large pocket of Yemeni and Iraqi and Lebanese Arabs who've been there for almost now three, four generations. And I have a picture of the Ford Motor Company because they went there to work in the Ford plants. And to be exact, Ford recruited people, especially from Yemen, because they were famous shipbuilders and he wanted to learn the technology. And therefore, that's why you have an influx of the Yemeni community in Detroit and in the Dearborn area. Religiously diverse, like I said, not all Arabs are Muslim. Uh, we have a lot of Coptic Christians. We A lot of them are Greek Orthodox, Armenian, Christian, Catholic. So they really run the gamut. Also among the um, Islamic faith, whether they're Sunni or whether they're Shiite. Uh, and majority of them are highly educated with very middle class backgrounds. Next slide, please. So this leads to our third point about Arab and Muslim students in schools, intent versus impact. And I wanted to give a little bit of a background history 101 about the difference between Muslims and Arabs, because this is where all the mixture comes in within the schools and how teachers and schools and curriculum can really hopefully help meet the needs of Arab and Muslim students in schools. So next slide, please. <clears throat> So research, there's been research on students feeling, you know, included or not included. Um, a lot of students feel uh, exclusion or lack of acceptance of Arab and Muslim identities and also leads to that famous uh, duality and double consciousness with W.E.B. Du Bois also talked about for our, our, um, our uh, um, black students as well that, in, that ultimately hinder student progress. They don't feel like they fit in with their non-Arab or Muslim counterparts, but at the same token, being a first generation or second generation in this country, you also don't fit in with the people who you tend to think you would identify with. So they have this duality and double consciousness, which kind of makes them feel excluded because they're also not seeing anything at the school that really reflects who they are in their lived experience. Second point is very important. American, um, Arab American and Muslim students are either hyper visible when it comes to bullying and negative attention or invisible when it comes to academic supports and help hyper visible when it comes to bullying and negative tension because unfortunately 9-11 is a very good example. All of a sudden everything becomes focused on what happened in 9-11. Students become either bullied, ridiculed, put on the spot because they're either Arab or Muslim and people tend to want to focus more on that. Yeah, and there's no understanding either prior or after that, that becomes something that makes them hyper visible in a negative way. But then invisible when it comes to academic supports and help, because they're not identified in any of the census, that they're not identified in schools, and it comes up as, for example, white, they're not given the need to address themselves culturally, linguistically, or even sometimes religiously, because it just comes up and they're kind of under the radar with that one. And finally, unfortunately, educators are often just familiar with the stereotypical media based Arab and Muslim narratives um, that work with them. But we also can't deny that there's implicit and explicit bias that comes from educators. And that 
comes through with the curriculum, that comes through with what teachers are showing in their classroom, and also, unfortunately, some of the comments that are being made in schools. It is known that a lot of the bullying, I think they said about 20% of the bullying that happens with students, unfortunately, comes from the adults and not from the students. So that also adds another layer to the issues that a lot of our Arab and Muslim students have to face. And also think of it this way, when you have a kid who's Arab Christian, but then all of a sudden he's lumped in with all these Muslims, it really creates, again, going back to that duality and double consciousness, and he just, or he or she feels lost, or they feel lost in their own sense of identity. Next slide, please. So, so like I said, it's always there's in between, you know, I've written curriculum, I've worked on curriculum, I still do. And, you know, unfortunately, the curriculum becomes all or nothing. To the left of my, on my screen, you have a picture of Islamic Spain. Everybody talks about Islamic Spain and the thrive of Islam and the cultural um, achievements during Islamic Spain. We have nothing else in the curriculum until we get to 9-11. There's nothing in between. There's nothing that talks about what I just discussed about Arab immigration in the, early, in the late 1800s and 1900s. Nothing about enslaved Africans and what they have brought and contributed as well, being Muslim. And then we just go from one extreme to another. So that leaves this huge void in between for our students where they don't see the windows, the sliding uh, doors or the mirrors of themselves. It's either in the past that's non-existent or in the present where they're, again, they're hyper visible, but in a negative connotation. So these are just some statistics that we have about um, what with bullying, although this is a little bit dated, but it just shows the rise of hate crimes against Muslims. I mean, it rose over a thousand percent from 2000, 2001. That's just one, according to FBI markings. And this is after the FBI have started tracking a lot of this were prior. This didn't happen. And notice that the time frame as well of when all of this has um, occurred, unfortunately, was after, you know, 9-11. Um, there has been a rise of anti-Muslim hate in schools um, and bullying with school children. A lot of it is data-driven reports, and they say about 55% of Americans voice unfavorable opinions of Islam. And unfortunately, that isn't so much the fact that these people who have unfavorable opinions about Islam, are they themselves anti-Muslim? A lot of people still rely on media to get their news sources. They have not met people in their community who may be Muslim or may be Arab for them to really understand these the people that they quote unquote don't like or have a favorable opinion about them as well. And these attitudes really threaten and define um, fundamental meaning of American democracy because this again we all know what happens in the community goes into the school and vice versa. So it's important to understand all of this data and this research in order to see how we can help prevent that and really help the needs of our Arab and Muslim students whether it's in Baltimore County or across the nation. And recently, you know, we've seen kind of an uptick, uh, unfortunately, in uh, harassment and bullying for especially Muslim students and especially Muslim females. As you can see, I'm what we call a hijabi, a person who covers. So it's easier to identify a Muslim female, especially if she wears hijab, as opposed to identifying a Muslim girl who doesn't wear hijab or a Muslim male or who identifies as a male. But the problem is, is those are, they're easy targets. And then again, you have a lot of people who are countering these issues in their schools and they're facing a, a rise in these hates and these attacks, especially on females, because they're easily identifiable. And then that quote also, you have what I call, you know, intent versus impact. That is a note to my daughter where her college professor was looking through her paper and one, the one sentence in there says, I'm assuming English is a second language, but I'm not meaning to insult you if that is not the case. So my I was born and raised here. My daughter was born and raised here, but automatically the college professor assumed just from my daughter's writing that she's, you know, an easy, you know, an uh, English language learner because she speaks another language or her name is different. And that's on a small, what we would call soft aggression um, phase. Students get this a lot where I know um, friends who say their students have been, their own children have been asked to talk about certain very sensitive topics because they are Muslim or they've been called out on that. Um, I've also had a, a family friend call me one day because her daughter who does attend Baltimore County schools where a student came in and was flat out calling her names, calling her insults because of who she was. And he knew that she was Muslim, although she looks white passing, very fair skin, you know, um, blue eyes. 
And the matter wasn't taken too seriously, again, because these are issues that are on the forefront right now for a lot of schools. We don't know how to deal with our Arab and Muslim students, or we don't know what to do to address these needs. Therefore, there needs to be a better understanding. And also, sometimes when these happen, you have children who were parents maybe are new to this country and don't know how to maneuver the system. Therefore, it becomes something that's a, a, a totally another layer that becomes an issue for a lot of these students. And next slide, please. So beyond having their concerns about harassment dismissed, Muslim students sometimes must deal with school administrators who block their efforts to form identity groups. And this is very important. And what really, and I had this conversation before with um, someone who couldn't understand why when Muslim students feel threatened, when Muslim students are bullied, or when Muslim or Arab students especially feel like they are don't fit into their school or their um, school climate, they can't go to someone who doesn't identify with them. It's very difficult for them to explain where they're coming from to somebody who may not understand who they are. So in order for students to feel comfortable, just like we want for our um, black and brown students, we do need more school counselors, we need more teachers that identify with them, but also we need people who have that cultural understanding of our students in order to understand where they're coming from. So a lot of students feel like they don't have the sense of identity but also the importance that Islam and being a Muslim is an identity factor. It's really hard to separate the two. You could be, consider yourself a black American, but also Muslim. I'm Palestinian American, but also Muslim. That's the connecting factor between us, but you also can't separate it. And I think that's very difficult for a lot of schools to understand because of the separation of church and state. But being a Muslim and following the faith of Islam is actually a, uh, an identifying piece for students that I think a lot of um, teachers and administrators need to understand in order for them to better serve their students. So some of the solutions that I came up with, Mr. Corns, thank you. So here we have, you know, some statistics that the schools in Baltimore County are rapidly changing. We know the demographics are changing, but the lack of representation in teaching is. Um, as you can see for this, um, the graphic of the diversity of, uh, of Baltimore County, it's great, but for my, my children personally, where are they on that list? We technically are supposed to be white, but we're not. We would be others. So if there was something where my students need to have something really addressed for them and in the larger community, this is why Arabs are pushing for that on the census. There are particular cultural um, and ethnic markers that I, for Arabs or Muslims that need to be identified uh, in order for them to be uh, well represented within the community or within the school. So what we would think would be a really starting solution for some of the ways we can counter anti-Muslim hate or bigotry in the schools and for our Arab and Muslim students are, next slide please, Mr. Corns. So recommendations, uh, solutions, of course, curriculum, PD and resources. So here are some of the ideas that I had and we work with a lot of other. Number one, data collection. I think it's very important for especially Baltimore County with the influx not only of students who are born and raised here, but we do have a large pocket of refugees who came here. MENA, Middle Eastern and North African data. This is ignored in some scope um, for some schools, but it's it shouldn't be ignored because you need to address the needs that are very unique to those populations. But again, it's something that leads to the proper funding and the fact that you identify those students and you take them out from that white category. Counseling has always been something that I've talked about even when I was part of Baltimore County. Um, it's, a, it's a big need for Arab and Muslim students, especially our refugee and L students. When you come from areas like Afghanistan, Iraq or Syria, um, when I worked for the county, I did an affinity group with Muslim girls Muslim and Arab girls at one of the middle schools. And it was very helpful for them because I was able to understand where they came from, but also I would help them maneuver and navigate this new territory that they're in. And it's very important to have people who understand their, to understand our students better in order for them to help them navigate the world around them. And of course, professional development, PD for teachers, to learn a little bit more about the MENA population and Muslims, um, especially to remove the monolith ideology, but also because a lot of this spills into not only Arab Christians, but unfortunately you have the six students who get lumped into these tropes. And we've seen a lot of that, unfortunately, after 9-11, where you had the Sikh community because of the turban, which gets interchanged with the hijab, that they also get lumped into all of this. So more PDs for the 
uh, teachers to learn about MENA and the Muslim, their Muslim students, but also how to integrate it in the curriculum is very important because it really creates those windows and mirrors and as we call sliding doors. And another uh, idea, affinity groups. I'm currently working on an affinity group in one of the middle schools here in Baltimore County, and I can't stress enough how much the girls really appreciate it. Um, it started out because one of the girls was being harassed for wearing hijab, but to add to that layer, the girl identifies as a black American. So think of all the intersectionalities that come with it. When you have a female who is Muslim, who wears hijab, who is a student of color, there are so many things that she has to navigate, so many of those identity markers that she has to sift through. And creating the affinity group has really helped her come together with other Muslim students in the school. Again, I say Muslim because that's the identifying piece. Although all the other students may not be um, African-American, they all understand the connection between the um, the religion and the fact that the affinity group has created a safe space for these female students to come together and really stress um, their concerns and what they need um, at the school and even um, even at home or outside in the community. I personally love affinity groups. <laughs> um, there are a lot of great resources out there. University of Pennsylvania, UPenn has Teaching Beyond September 11th, uh, has really great detailed lessons on how to teach beyond September 11th to really dig deeper. But then there's a really great podcast, Islam in the United States. And these are some of the topics, the legacy of enslaved um, you know, Muslims in America, the Barbary Wars with Thomas Jefferson. A lot of people don't realize that. And then of course, um, American attitudes towards Islam and then hip hop and rap gateway. I mean, I know we have a, a hip hop course that's going on in, in uh, the curriculum, but you really can't differentiate the influence of Islam or Islamic teachings within that um, cultural piece as well. So it's not to say that there aren't resources out there, and it's not to say that there aren't people out there. We are out there, they are out there. You just need to find the right people to get um, to the materials and to help implement them into the right pieces of the curriculum so students feel more engaged and they see themselves more within what they're being taught in the classroom. Then, so I wanted to end it off with this because I think it was very important. So, so students' voices are inconvertible. We can't dismiss, deny, quantify, or rationalize away the voices and experiences of children at the margins. Allow them to be truth tellers and moral compasses for what you say you believe about equity, but learn to listen deeply without boomeranging into past practice. By choosing the margins at the starting point for our data conversations, those quiet places where the hopes, dreams, and stories of most disenfranchised students and families live, we invert the pyramid, shift the dynamics of power, and bring children to the center of educational discourse. And I think this is such a powerful way to end this presentation because if we do put our students, all of our students at the center, because what we do for our Muslim and Arab students, we're also helping educate the rest of the kids. And kids right now are really um, very aware of what's going on around the world. It's not as closed as it used to be before, and kids are really open to learning from each other, and we're developing a more empathetic and sympathetic generation. So why not start by shifting the dynamics and having this educational discourse by centering our Muslim and Arab students as well? And I believe that's the end of my presentation. And if anybody has any questions, that's, this is where you can find me. That's one of my Gmail addresses. Um, I'm more than welcome to answer any questions, uh, have a dialogue or anything else that I can do. And thank you for your time. Great. Thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. It was very, very informative. Thank you. Um, so that, uh, and it was also very well done. Um, I feel like I, learned a great deal of history. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, thank you. So um, yeah, so it looks like we have some questions. Um, first, we'll start with uh, Miss Lily Rowe. Miss Rowe. Hello. Hello, how are you? Um, thank you for this presentation. It was it was very well done. Um, the question that I had about the first slide, um, if you could bring that up again. Um, one of the things that I wondered about it is that you have Protestant and Catholic, mm -hmm. but um, Orthodox Christians are the second largest Christian community in the world. Mm -hmm. And there's a significant number in the United States. And 
we have a number of large um, Coptic and Antiochian and Syrian churches mm -hmm. in Baltimore County and in the Baltimore, D.C. area. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if those demographics on the bottom, where in here did you put the Orthodox Christians? Or are they just not here? Because they would have a significant number of um, Arab people in them. Mm -hmm. So this is not something that I created. This was from the organization called the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. So oh. this is, yeah, this is their actual um, poll that they did. And I do understand that the Coptic, um, you know, uh, Christian religion does have a large Arab population. But like I said, this isn't my statistic. It's I through understand. ISPU and how, yeah, they're the ones who actually put it together. So it's not to say that there aren't other groups or religious um, or uh, religions that are diverse. We wanted to just highlight the fact that Islam in general around the world and even the country is extremely diverse compared to other groups, whether it's Arab or like we said, black Muslims or other um, ethnic or, or racial groups. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, and I wanted to make sure uh, I call on everyone. Ms. Jost, did you have a question? I know she's on the phone. Miss Jost, did you have a question or comment? No? Okay. Um, can Mr. Hanny? Uh, oh, I can, we can hear you now. Sorry, we can't hear you now. <laughs> we could hear you. Okay, um, we can come back to Miss Jost. Um, Mr. Handy, you had a comment? Uh, Yes, Ms. Scott, thank you. Um, Mission Howard, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my comment is really just to make sure everyone in the uh, council had access to their uh, their technology, because I know a few council members notified me they joined late. Um, so I wanted to make sure they eventually got on the roll, but also Mr. Corns, I know you were having to uh, give folks access to the chat and to uh, the microphone access. So I just wanted to make sure all council members had that access so they could um, ask questions if they chose to do so. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Corwin, it looks like he said all do. Okay, great. And um, I wanted to know, um, oh, Ms. Jost, are you back with us? Okay, looks like we still can't hear her. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Ms. Jost. Oh, thank you. Um, so, thank you for the presentation. It was explained pretty well. My question is the intersectionality of not all Arabs are Muslims. There's a significant amount of uh, Christians as well as even Jewish Arabs uh, and the intersectionality of uh, Persians who are not really Arabs, but are usually called Arabs because they wear the hijab or the niqab. Um, so. Oh, I think you went out again, Ms. Joes. Oh, it looks like she went out again. Are you still there, Miss Joseph? You are. We can't hear you. But I think I just want to add a really quick comment to what I think what Miss Jost was um, also discussing: the fact that when we talk about Muslims, again, the point of me making this distinction is not all Muslims are Arabs, and yes, even within the Arab population. They're very diverse, right? No, per, the people from Iran are not really, they're not considered Arab, they're Persian. But again, that goes with all the economic and the political um, structures that happened that lumped everybody into this monolith. But yes, even among the Arabs themselves, they're extremely diverse. So there is, again, that distinction. I think the major distinction I wanted to make was the fact that we can't say all Muslims are Arabs, but at the same time, we can't say that all Arabs are Muslim either. We have Arab Christians, we have Arab Muslims, we have Arab Druze, we have Arab Jews. So that was the major distinction that we wanted to have in this conversation today. Okay, yeah, I think that's where Ms. Jost was was going. Um, and I think that, that you made that point, that's important. Um, it, it shows how diverse um, uh, it is, and also how diverse um, the children are um, in, in our system. I wanted to know the recommendations that you put up. Um, I thought that was very good, and I just wanted to find out from um, 
Uh, Mr. Handy, um, as far as those recommendations, are we already incorporating any of those? Um, yes, Ms. Scott. So, or anything? Mm -hmm. so the we are so the um, affinity groups um, are happening in in pockets. It's certainly something we can expand upon um, affinity groups for our students, and then even you know making sure we have affinity mm -hmm. groups for staff. Uh, the counseling, uh, we have a ways to go, and uh, we work very closely with our Office of um, School Counseling and Student and Support Services. So certainly another topic we'll be engaging with uh, for them along those lines. I'm very intrigued by the first recommendation on data collection um, because, as Ms. Shinawi mentioned, that's not a part of the U.S. Census. So I need to investigate, you know, could we do that within BCPS, even though it doesn't happen within the census? Um, but I, that one to me is very intriguing and I think it's very necessary because, you know, think I'm, we make these data driven decisions and if we can't even collect data on students who are experiencing harassment or even if you think about our, our climate survey that recently went out, you know, I, I, we're, we're missing some information that we need. So uh, that's one I certainly will be following up on. Really, I'll follow up on all of these, but I would say other than the affinity groups um, and some professional development, we certainly can go um, much deeper. I do want to mention too, social studies, Office of Social Studies, I know they've done some professional development um, and they they really, I think, are staying at the forefront of making sure that the teachers are, um, are have access to professional learning that's very timely and appropriate based on the world at large and our student population. Um, so I work very closely with uh, John Billingsley and folks in social studies as well. So uh, we'll continue to move these forward, uh, but we do have some work to do. Okay, thank you. It uh, looks like there's a question from Ms. Bianca Crockett. Hi, my question is um, about testing and assessments that happen during certain times with this, you know, the Muslims, with Muslims being such a big part of Baltimore County, testing them and assessing them during, you know, a period of Ramadan or something like that doesn't seem to be best practice, not only for, you know, the Muslims, but anyone who's hungry, it's not doesn't make sense to assess them at that time. They are not at their best. So what is the county um, doing to kind of navigate that to make sure that we're getting the best information and best data out of all of our students? I, I can't I'm, I can't speak specifically on behalf. Hi, Bianca, how are you? Um, on behalf of the, you know, I know the county is working hard on trying to navigate all of these. I think the one thing that people also need to understand is the Muslim calendar is lunar. It's just like the Jewish calendar. So our holidays don't fall at the same time every year, right? Thank God, because of when we fasted in July and August, we were done. So now that it's coming around in April, um, it's it's always different. So it's I think one important piece is to reach out to Muslim leaders within the community. And again, they are there. Um, and if people don't know, you know, you have people like me that you can reach out to. People, you know, parents are part of the community. Um, and I think just to plan when they plan their calendar, just to see it where it falls. I know testing is something that's you know all schools have to struggle with and meeting the needs of their students. Um, I did share with uh, Megan Shea of CNI uh, an amazing letter to educators from a colleague of mine that I can also share with Mr. Handy and Ms. Scott that gives you a lot of educators pointers on how to address the needs of Muslim students while they are fasting and how they can be proactive um, uh, again with their students. So that's also very important. But I think just looking at the calendar in general and saying, OK, when does Ramadan fall next year? So this year it falls in April. Next year it'll probably be um, you know, late March or early April as well, because again, because it isn't the same every year, just like Easter, it's lunar, you know, it changes. So that's something that they may want to take into consideration. Thank you for the question. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, we have uh, Mr. Christian Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott, and uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It was very inc incredibly created, and um, this is a topic that I've been wanting to hear from, especially from talking to our students. Uh, I want to start off by mentioning the fact that uh, both of our small finalists this year are Muslim students in Baltimore County. They're Egyptian. Uh, they're from they're from Egypt, and they're Muslim students. Uh, one is one wears a hijab, and one does not. And during the campaign for student member of the board, our uh, our, our finalist who does wear a hijab um, was negatively. Um, 
harassed because of, of wearing a hijab in multiple different scenarios and multiple different presentations. I think that's something that we need to really be looking into in BCPS and make sure that we are respecting our hijabi students and make sure making sure that we are creating inclusive spaces. So I just wanted to, to share that. Um, there are many Muslim students I'm very close with at Eastern Tech and uh, over the course of this year, they brought a few concerns to me. One is uh, the fact that some students don't feel like there is enough time for to for Muslim students to complete prayers without having to miss class. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit um, in your experience as an educator and maybe some ways that we can provide opportunities for our Muslim students to, uh, to complete their prayers. So prayer is a very, it's, it's a touchy subject, I think, especially in a public school setting. Um, I think that could be something that could be discussed within Baltimore County with the board and also um, if there's something that could be on a school to school um, basis on how they want to address that that need. So it's something that has to have a larger conversation with more than just myself. Yeah. And, you know, with the community, because, again, in a public school setting and that's where it gets um, more understanding about why it's so important for these kids to make sure that they they um, follow their prayers. Because again, in Islam, there's five prayers throughout the day as opposed to one in the morning and one at night. And then right. seeing how those can be accommodated, if they can be accommodated um, as well. So I think that's a larger conversation that needs to be had within the school system and the board themselves to come to some sort of agreement on how that can we how that can be accommodated if it can be and how it also doesn't hinder on students um, achievement of course if they're at eastern tech you know we we know all of a sudden that those kids already are you know they have their whole lives planned out and they know exactly what they're going to do next or what have you but yeah that's a larger conversation i can't speak to it myself um, on what can be or cannot be done only because we have to make sure that we're um we're not crossing certain boundaries and certain lines with, within that, but I think it would be a good conversation to have regarding, um, you know, the larger construct of praying and faith in, in the religion. Um, but to go back to your comment about the student who was harassed because of hijab, I think what people don't understand, and this is what I talked about with Mr. Handy regarding the equity um, language, is you have to put religion in there because if a female Muslim girl is being harassed for hijab, I've seen boys who are of the Sikh faith who wear a turban who get harassed. Or if you have a Jewish boy who wears the kippah on his head. So religion is an integral part of a lot of our students, whether they're Muslim or not. So when we add that piece of religion as part of the harassment, we are really broadening the sense. It could even be a kid who wears a cross who is religious, right? Or wears something that overly identifies them with their religion. So it's very important that we add that because again, with her being harassed because she is outwardly facing people knew who she was as a Muslim, how do we address that? And if we don't have that language in there, then I think that causes pause as to why it's not in there. And if it's not in there, how can we get it in there so it could also be added and addressed? But thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and thank you for your response. I, I think that was beautiful. Um, thank you. I'm excited to be able to tell the students that I was able to bring this up uh, in our committee meeting. Um, you, you mentioned the curricula and how there's some major gaps in, in American history. And I, it took me back to eight, taking AP United States history last year when a student, a Muslim student in my class posed the question, you know, where do, where, where do Muslim students, where are Muslim, where's the Muslim population reflected in uh, colonial America? And our, our teacher responded with, well, there really wasn't, there really weren't any Muslim American, there really weren't any Muslim immigrants, there really mm -hmm. weren't any Muslim impacts um, mm -hmm. on colonial America. And I just learned today that that isn't the case at all. So no. I, we definitely do need to be diving into our curriculum department. And I, I know that you said that you've been in contact uh, with Ms. Shea, which is really, really important um, mm -hmm. with respect to that. Um, also, for our Muslim Student Associations and our affinity groups for students, um, that same student who was in my A-Push class was the student who actually founded our Muslim Student Association at Eastern mm. Tech. And it was met with resistance because it is a, a, a religious organization. It is a religious-based club. And so uh, a question I have is you, you mentioned that you started an affinity group at, at your school. And I'm wondering what kind of resistance maybe had you faced and what are some ways that we can make the process easier to create those affinity groups? So when I worked for Baltimore County, I created an affinity group for, and I, and this is why allies and co-conspirators are so important, Christian, right? Um, I worked in tandem with the ESOL department chair at the middle school that I was working with to create the affinity group. And she was able to identify the students I wanted to focus on refugee students. 
mm-hmm. um, or in new immigrants that are to the to the country because I wanted to help them navigate that system. Luckily, I didn't get any pushback. Um, teachers were very appreciative. Uh, they liked the idea that I was able to kind of be the go-to person to help them address some of the needs that some of the students had because I could identify, I could relate to them and they could relate to me. Now, the other affinity group that I'm a part of now actually came out of a necessity because a girl was harassed and a girl was being bullied due to the fact that she wore hijab. So it really is no resistance in the fact that people are saying, no, you shouldn't have it. It came out of a necessity in order to make sure that they address those needs because, again, unfortunately, we don't have a counselor who can sit with the student and talk to her about her hijab or her lived experience because it's not it's it's something that's relatively new to a lot of schools right so creating the affinity group has really it that middle school that i'm working with i think everybody has been very supportive everybody understands the need and everybody understands the need in response to the negative reaction that happened to that student so they're seeing that this is creating a positive influence for their students and also alleviates the pressure from the teachers and it alleviates the pressure from administration to sit there and get those questions as to well why aren't you doing this with my student and bringing in a person who has of a lived experience and has the experience to deal with um, especially middle school because I taught middle school, it really creates that collaboration with the school. And now the school is looking at different ways that they can incorporate this into their school climate. Because again, what we do well for one group of students definitely benefits all students. When we're talking about Muslim students and Arab students, we're not doing it in a sense we want to exclude them. Absolutely not. Like I see in the quote, like uh, Ms. Rowe was talking about Orthodox Arabs, a lot of people don't know right? And a lot of people make assumptions. So we want kids to understand that Arabs are a very diverse group of people. Muslims are a very diverse group of people. We are here. We've been here. So how can we help people understand better and learn more about these groups of um, students? Thank you. And I just have one last comment and question. Um, mm-hmm. And it's referring to a visit that I made to Chadwick Elementary School. Uh, there was a student who was who was taking me around uh, the school, and he was, he was my tour guide. And he mentioned that uh, he was very excited. He mentioned he's a fifth grade student that during uh, Ramadan uh, they actually have a separate table for Muslim students to maybe go to, so they're not surrounded by food, and so they they're not um, surrounded by, by 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 what's occurring in the cafeteria. And I'm wondering what are some more supports you think we could provide for students during Ramadan um, to continue to allow them to thrive academically, but to ensure that we're being respectful of, of, of their fasting. Well, I think not having them in the cafeteria would, would be a good start, <laughs> you know, like providing them. I think what kids love to do and for my own my own children as well as being in the library, being in a quiet place. Kids love to read. They have access to a form of technology or even looking into a teacher. I know there are a lot of teachers who just love being with their students or would open up their classrooms for their students. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drop in the chat the actual um, the the letter that my colleague wrote to educators as to help how to help address like the question that you you asked. But I think just providing a safe space and exempting students from certain things because they are tired and they don't want to be around food, not to totally exclude them from their friends and their peers because it's a very good teachable moment for them. But I think just letting students understand that we understand what you're going through and we're honoring your um, your fast. So here are some ways that we can accommodate uh, you as you fast. But, you know, in the lunchroom oh, may not be such a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, thank you so much for your response. You're welcome. Thank you. See you on behalf of Muslim students. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> So I don't see um, any other questions, but um, Ms. Ramadan Shinawi, thank you very, very much for coming and for sharing this um, history with us and um, also these recommendations. So I uh, greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yes. All right. So um, if there are no other questions, then we will move on to the next item. And the next item for the council to discuss is the purpose and structure of the Equity Advisory Council. And this will also be facilitated by Mr. Handy. All right. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I believe Mr. Corns is gonna switch out our presentation. While he's doing that, I uh, just wanna remind our other council members, uh, the presentation you saw is an example of, um, again, your lived experience, your identity, if you'd like to share something that the committee members did ask um, to be shared at, at these meetings. So. Uh, please reach out and let me know if you're interested in, in uh, presenting on a topic. 
um, that is important to you and related to uh, equity uh, within BCPS. All right, so what I do, this is a bit of a review. It was really about a year ago uh, that the committee decided to go forward with the council. So I want to do a review and talk about how we can move forward as a council. Um, so next slide, please, Mr. Corns. All right, so it started with the what? So uh, the advisory council serves um, in an advisory capacity to the uh, Board of Ed Equity Committee. Um, the purpose is uh, to provide engagement opportunities for both internal and external stakeholders to discuss systemic equity challenges, which are impacted by policy and budget decisions. So um, in working with Ms. Ramadan Shanawi, um, we wanted to make sure there was some connection to uh, the committee's work around uh, policy and budget. And hopefully you could see some of that from the presentation. Um, but essentially as council members, you are here to um, offer your perspectives, um, to be in an advisory capacity uh, to the committee members um, so they can uh, take action around policy and budget um, to make sure we have more equitable outcomes of the school system. Next slide, please. All right, and then this is again, these are historic uh, slides, but just to show where we've uh, started and where we've uh, been since then. Um, in the beginning, uh, the committee was going to meet on a semester basis or twice a year. We had a pretty good discussion in November of 2021, and that's when we decided that four meetings a year would be um, desirable by the committee and the council members. Um, and then we have been continuing to meet uh, virtually. Uh, we do have the option to meet at a school site um, if folks uh, want to do that, but we have continued to meet virtually throughout this year. Next slide, please. And then this is the who. So I wanted to take some time with this um, because we have some folks. I want to thank, um, we have some committee members who have attended or council members who've been at every meeting. We've had three, this is the third meeting. So thank you for those with perfect attendance. We really appreciate you taking out your time and energy to be a part of this council. Um, there are folks who've reached out to me and said they, they wouldn't be able to make it. So thank, thank you to those who haven't been able to make it and have notified me of that. So uh, we want to move forward with folks who are committed to being a part of this council. So this was the original request um, last year and we really honored this. So the council will be in alignment with policy 0100 equity. Uh, which is really the, the policy we all stand on uh, when we do our equity work within BCPS. So internally, we uh, want to have six principles, one elementary and one secondary from each zone. Um, there should be a focus on middle school. Um, so we want two um, to be from middle schools and we, we've taken care of that. So principals have been phenomenal in their attendance. Thank you to principals. Um, six teachers, uh, one elementary and one secondary from each zone. Um, I will say that we have some teachers who um, have um, been attending. We do have some who um, I think have not attended any. Um, so I'll be doing some follow up because what we want to do, if this is not, you know, the opportunity for them, then we want to make sure we have some um, those positions filled with with teachers who are engaged and ready to be a part of the council. Um, have some particular concerns around students. Um, I, I know. Um, <laughs> Mr. Thomas has been here, um, of course, and I think he missed a meeting and he told us before that he wouldn't be able to make it. Um, attendance from the students is, is is not what we wanted to be nor needed to be. Uh, Ms. Ramadash and now we ended with some, um, you know, talk about the importance of student voice and we know we're here for the students. That's that's why we're all here to do what we do. So I will be doing some recruitment um, to get some students on to um, onto this council and Mr. Thomas might be reaching out to you. Uh, maybe you can assist. I know you will be graduating. Um, perhaps you've got some some folks who well, we can um, get on um, to a council and I'll also be following up with um, uh, Ms. Murray and some other folks to to work through that. Um, Office of Title One representative, so Ms. Stansberry has been here, HR, Ms. Lowry. Um, I'm actually representing my team in actual ex equity and cultural proficiency. Um, so let's look at external, uh, which is our next slide. So externally, uh, we're doing pretty good. Uh, we do have some folks on this list who we have not heard from. Um, overall, though, we're doing pretty good. I won't go through every bullet on this list, um, but again, my goal is to make sure we have representation um, from the external stakeholders that we've identified. If representation is missing, do some follow up. Also actively recruiting um, some, some external stakeholders even beyond um, what we have here. So um, there'll be some folks who I'm expecting to attend our last meeting in May. They weren't able to make it today. Um, but they will be attending in May. So just want to let you all know I'm actively uh, recruiting and checking our, our you know, membership roster to make sure that uh, we have, you know, folks who are committed to carrying for, forward with the work of the council. All right, next slide, please. 
All right, and then um, the how. This was again from the original presentation. So what could the topics or direction of discussion be? We really framed that out um, around presentations such as the one you've heard this evening. Um, really any topics that impact equity uh, within your purview as a council member is what we were looking to bring to um, these meetings. And then the structure. So this is the part we really need to do some work on. Are we going to operate as simply a whole group, um, a, you know, a complete council, or will we go into subgroups? So remember, we have a, we have a group of principals, a group of teachers. We, need, we will have a group of students, so we could cluster folks into work groups, if you will, or subgroups. Um, I don't really like that term, but let's say work groups. Um, so there's an organization I like to discuss and we, you know, we also need to talk about, you know, some leadership around the council. Um, you know, who's going to take the lead in, in driving the work forward and helping to organize the activities of the council. Um, and then um, what is the intended impact on policy and budget? So remember, those are the core functions of our Board of Education. So the work we do should help advise on, around policy and budget. So the council needs to keep that at the forefront um, of their work at all times. All right, next slide, please. So to help us get started, have a problem of practice, and I want to give credit to um, our committee for coming up with this. Um, at our meeting last week, uh, the committee shared some topics of interest um, for our Board of, Equ Board of Education Equity Committee meetings, and one that bubbled up, and um, I believe Dr. Hager brought this one up. Um, it's around uh, the participation by the public um, as far as public comment. And the question was, you know, how could the process for public comment be more accessible and more inclusive? Uh, we know how diverse our school system is. Uh, we owe it to our Board of Education to have uh, the diversity of the system reflected in the comments that they receive as board members. Um, and fr frankly, we need to make sure um, everyone feels empowered to let their voice be heard. So uh, we do have a policy, 8315, um, around the participation by the public. Uh, there are some models out there that we may be able to tap into. Um, from around the state and around the country to help us uh, to broaden our reach as far as public comment. So this is what I thought would be good for the council to start on. Uh, so my goal is to take this problem of practice, do some follow up outside of this meeting, because um, this is a public meeting because we have a quorum of the board. So that's why these meetings um, are public in alignment with the Maryland Public uh, Meetings Act. Uh, but as a council, we're able to meet um, apart from the board members apart from the committee. So the council can meet on its own and start to do some work around this particular policy or there might be another topic that bubbles up. But I thought this would be a good one to get it started because it's also it's already something that's been brought up um, by the equity committee as a topic of interest and it would be a nice way for us to um, get the um, council started on some some meaningful work. All right and next slide please Mr. Coins. All right so um, couple topics just to round us out. Um, I'd like us to get together um, and I know the, the summer can be a good time to delve into work. Um, I'll make sure I follow up offline to find out, uh, you know, times that are accessible to council members. Again, we might go into smaller groups to do our work, but I'd like us before we enter the 22-23 school year to develop a plan of work uh, for the advisory council. And um, I want that work to be driven by council members and I'm available to assist. Um, I have a, you know, a team, my staff can assist, um, but I want to make sure going to next year, we do have a plan of work um, that will guide us. Um, also looking for some volunteers to be a part of the planning team. Again, I know folks have taken time out to attend these meetings. Um, anyone has some, some interest in being a part of a planning team that could help frame out the work going forward, um, I'll be seeking some participants uh, for the planning team as well. Um, and then lastly, when I reach out to you all, you know, looking for dates and times um, that are convenient for you all as a planning team to meet, and I'll be there to lend my support and any resources that I can lend to help us move forward. So right now, just some 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 uh, items that I'd like you to think about. Um, and again, I'll be following up um, in the next few days to uh, look for uh, some folks who are willing to be a part of, of these plans. All right, I think um, Mr. Corns, that may be my last slide. I think so. So, okay. okay. Yeah, so Miss Scott, I think that's yeah. all I had. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, and thank you for that, because that for that one, uh, that's all that I see for that. And the next one that we had is um, the next item for the council to discuss is the problem of practice. And I have you down for that as well. Yes, so um, Mr. Corns, we can go back to that slide, please, um, for the problem of practice. And Miss Scott, uh, so I kind of rolled it all together and I'm just okay. keeping, um, keeping an eye on the time. So um, 
unless if, if anyone does have some comment now, um, if it's OK, Miss Scott, we can hear some comments. I really Certainly. just want yeah, really just wanted to plant to see. So does anyone have any uh, comments or remarks in regard to this problem of practice? Um, please share any comments you have at this time, but we'll delve deeper. Um, you know, at a later time. Anyone have any thoughts, comments on this particular problem? Or area of focus? All right, yeah, and I don't see anything in the chat. So um, yeah, and if anyone thinks of anything later, I'm sure they can email you, Mr. Handy. Yes. Okay. And I'll be reaching out to them as well. It looks Ms. like there's Scott. a comment from Mr. Thomas. Yes, I'm still trying to understand my role in here as a board member or as a member of the Equity Council, but I'm I'm just going to speak now. I think um, participation by the public uh, for a comment, I, I do think we can be more inclusive and more accessible. I know that board members have discussed moving the board meetings across the county, but I don't know how feasible that would be. So I'd suggest allowing an option for people to give virtual public comment. I think that's a, a, something that we could be doing, and I think it could be incredibly easy for us to, um, especially with our, we have an entire new person who's staffing our, or going to be leading our IT department. And I think that would open the opportunity. I've been looking into Montgomery County and their operations, and they have a hybrid model with every meeting pretty much and giving public comment. So I think that would be uh, something that would allow us to really hear from our stakeholders in a greater way um, and, and wouldn't require people from all the way down from Lansdowne coming up to Towson or all the way up from Hereford coming down to Towson for a meeting. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. OK, and it looks like the last item on for us to discuss, because I do want to be aware of our time um, uh, for the council to discuss is planning meetings for the future. And I think you did touch on that, Mr. Handy. So yes, um, yeah, Ms. Scott, if, mm -hmm. pardon me if I may, I just wanted to go back to um, Ms. Denmeyer's comment um, in the chat, just related to the discussion around public comments. So just wanted to uh, make sure that uh, that was seen. And I didn't know if she wanted to comment or if she may, Ms. Scott, before we move on. Ms. Denmeyer, I don't know if, did you want to add anything to what you put in the chat? Sure. Um, and just being someone who watches the board meetings and you know, I take notes and I think about um, a lot of what is presented and as a member of BCPS, some of it sometimes um, becomes more clear and then sometimes I have more questions. And I think our community, um, especially the community that I serve, I often have parents ask me questions after board meetings. And I think it would be a great way for people to give um, or have an opportunity to give an opinion. And I love Christian's idea of allowing for a virtual comment because like he said, you know, coming from all, we serve such a large community and our communities in and of themselves are very diverse and not everyone is able to be there at that moment during that meeting. And it would be nice if people had ways to provide an opinion or a comment or a statement or ask questions or pose maybe um, some solutions to issues that, that they have with their particular community or school or whatever it is um, to do that in a virtual setting. And that would allow for not necessarily screening to censor, but screening for time and for content. Just a thought. Thank you. Are there any other questions? OK, Mr. Handy, you can go ahead with the dates. OK. Uh, so thank you, Ms. Scott. So again, I will follow up via email with our uh, council members to determine some dates for our planning meeting and also to see who's willing to participate. I know I have um, at least one planning team member, Ms. Denmeyer. Thank you for for uh, stepping out and volunteering for that. Uh, so that's all I have, Ms. Scott. So I uh, believe you are next. Uh, we'll pass it back to you. Um, and I think we'll be ready to close out soon. So thank you. OK. Were there any other questions or any comments from any um, council members or board members? I didn't want to cut anyone off. OK, great. Um, all right. Well, Oh, sorry. Yes. Again, sorry. I, I feel like I keep commenting um, after after the fact. Uh -huh. like, when uh, we were discussing, Mr. Handy, and you discussed bringing students in and, and reaching out to me, I had a thought and I wanted to share it aloud, if that's okay. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Thomas. Okay. 
I think one of the things we should do is instead of maybe selecting students or selecting people to join the council, I think we should maybe have a news release that's like opening it up an application for anyone who wants to join the council to have the opportunity. I think there are so many students across BCPS that I'm not in contact with and I haven't had the means to discuss with that would love to serve on this equity council. And if we had an Instagram post, a Twitter post, and students were like, hey, students, we want you to serve on the equity council, then we'd have some really passionate people who would come to serve. And, you know, you could look through the applications and choose for or representing the, the different zones. And I think even for vacancies that we might have now, that would be another great way to recruit people. Um, filling out an application is, I think, something that uh, shows initiative and, and, and drive to be a part of this. Thank you for that, Mr. Thomas. Were there any other questions or comments? Ms. Scott, may I respond to Mr. Thomas? Yes, please. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Thomas, for that. I I do have concerns that sometimes we go with the, I'm going to say, typical channels. Uh, we are continuing to marginalize certain um, students and, and certain student voices. Uh, so I do appreciate uh, your recommendation to to widen the net, so to speak. Uh, so I am I am looking for some ways to to get some. And I've, I've met some students in my travels who uh, they've made it clear they have some some things to share. And I think some some uh, perspectives that I think I, this this council could really use and, and this committee. So thank you for that. I will be looking for some strategies to, to, to um, broaden our reach in that regard. Thank you. OK, thank you. And it looks like there's a question from Miss um, Marlia Collington per Purcell. Is she muted? <clears throat> I'm sorry, Miss Marlena Purcell. Did you yeah. have a question? Mm -hmm. Yes, good evening, good afternoon. Um, good evening. I just wanted to know if possible we can get the date that you propose for your summer planning sessions. Um, just trying to get my vacation time around that and mm -hmm. making sure that I am available if the need arises for someone on the advisory council um, to attend. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Uh, Mr. Handy, do we have our summer dates? Uh, we don't have them yet, Ms. Scott and um, Ms. Purcell, so I, I will be following up um, by next week uh, to the council members, and um, I hope Ms. Purcell is not planning vacation around. That's some commitment there, so maybe you have a vacation. We can plan around that, but I will be in touch with the council members because um, I would like them to help me determine the dates. I know I, I will be on duty this summer, um, so um, yes, I will be in touch um, by next week to start to gather those dates, but thank you for that. Thank you. And it looks like there's a question from Miss Bianca Crockett. Yes, sorry, it's too late and my typing fingers are dying. That's supposed to say, what about parent voice for younger elementary students? Is that something um, that we may possibly be looking for? To be represented here also in this council. Um, do you have the list up, Mr. Handy, of the different um, <clears throat> groups that are involved? Um, yes, Ms. Scott, I do. That may speak to that. Yeah, Mr. Corns, could you go back to, there's a slide that, you know, has an um, external stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so when it said voice, it said middle school and high school. So I was wondering for the elementary students, how is their voice being represented in that? So not this slide, the slide before that. It said middle and high school students. OK, so Ms. Crockett, that's what makes you sure understand. So are you asking for this? Because in the chat, you said parent voice for younger students. Parent you voice for younger students. So like we're not going to get like third graders logging on at seven o'clock at night to to provide feedback of like how things are impacting them, but a parent voice for that younger student. I'm just wondering if that younger voice is going to be represented. Gotcha. It, so, mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Scott. I it looks like it was represented in the second slide through the uh, representatives from PTA. Um, but go ahead, Mr. Handy. Correct, so Ms. Scott. Thank you for PTA, and I think I need to reach back out to them. Also, but Ms. Crockett, I was also pointing out to so the parent representatives. I, I will tell you, our West Zone parent representative resigned, and the representative that I recruited, um, she cannot make it this evening. She has elementary. She does have an elementary age child, so. Okay. I mean, I know we're just talking about one representative, but um, I, I am being cognizant of making sure we have that voice represented. At the same time, like let's say, and I know you're an elementary school teacher, if you know of a parent 
um, that would be a good member of this council, I'm certainly open to to adding um, members in that regard as well. OK, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. OK, any other comments or questions? All right. Well, I thank everyone so much for joining us. And um, again, to Ms. Um, Ramadan Shanawi, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm looking forward to um, uh, the future ones um, from our, our vast council. So um, yeah, so if there's no further business or any other questions, um, then the meeting is adjourned. And again, I thank everyone for joining us and I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.